Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to yet another Horus Heresy lore roundup video. We are still on the ninth book, The Mechanicus. So, after Adept Seth's wonderful attempt of annihilating our own goddamn forge complex, we return to more mortal affairs, because you see, outside of Adept Seth's massive fucking bomb, things had been progressing rather rapidly. The Fabricator General had been led to the vaults of Moravec by Horus's emissary, but before he was allowed to look inside which he so dearly wanted, he had to be made a tiny little bit more receptive. As such, Horus's emissary infected the Fabricator General with scrap code, essentially the digitalized version of Chaos turning him more surely than any oath of loyalty ever would, because even though Horus had a considerable amount of leverage over the Fabricator General at this point, he was not at all unaware of the fact that the General had turned his cloak a rather unfortunate number of times now, and he had to be sure that he wouldn't turn his cloak yet again. And so after this little bit of persuasion, the Fabricator General was allowed into the vaults, where he saw the mad creations of Moravec. Various monstrous constructions of flesh, chaos, and machinery combined into horrifying new forms, enough to drive any sane person well and truly up the goddamn wall. But considering that the Fabricator General's opinions had now been subtly altered by the introduction of various horrifying monstrosities directly into his bloody skull, he saw it all as the finest art. And he had no compunctions whatsoever of producing these wonderful melds of chaos, flesh, and machinery in his own forges. And so he began preparing for an all-out war on the Red Planet. The first step, of course, was to take these monstrosities locked away in the vault and begin mass production. First, the slaves, the dregs of societies, and the various indentured servants would be converted and improved upon into these new chaotic molds. Then, slowly but surely, the Skitarii contingents of the Fabricator General's forges would be enlightened as well, through force if necessary. This was done by introducing the malicious scrap code into the governmental network of the Fabricator General's forges. Now, most people within a forge is in some way modified to tap into that forge's data network, which means that whenever they did so after the scrap code had been released, they would be instantaneously infected with chaos and converted rather rapidly. Now that the Fabricator General had managed to get his own house in order, the next step was to introduce the scrap code to his vassal forgers, ensuring their loyalty, regardless of any opinions they might have had previously. Once this was complete, the Fabricator General had complete and utter control over his own forges and those directly loyal to him, not through oaths of loyalty, but through the rather unbreakable shackles of eternal damnation and corruption. Whoever said that chaos wasn't good for anything, eh? The next step was now to mobilize the forces indirectly linked to the Fabricator General. This meant any and all forces that had sworn oaths to the Fabricator General or to his forges, but were not directly under his command, and he chose to start with Legio Mortis. And it's right about now that a lot of things all happen at once, and don't worry, we'll get to the cliffhanger of last episode soon, just patience, but a moment. So, Legio Mortis has been ordered to walk in a rather provocative manner toward the Tempest Line. This line represents the borders between these two legions, and if either side were ever to cross said line, the other side would be well within their right to shoot at them. A fairly serious thing, and Legio Mortis was walking straight for it. Unfortunately for Tempestus, they didn't have a whole lot to stop them. They had a single reaver and two warhounds. Against them stood two warlords, a reaver, and Legio Mortis pride and joy, the Imperator class titan Aquila Ignis. 
Tempestus was monstrously outgunned. Now, this was not the first time that Mortis had been acting in a, shall we say, provocative manner. They had launched many a work on the Tempestus line, in an attempt to show their dominance. This was, in all due essentiality, the usual posturing between Titan legions, except this time they were getting far closer than usual, and they were marching a far larger number of engines than any previous occasion. Titan legions considered the honour of their engines to be paramount, and they would not rally such a beast as Aquila Ignis if they were not very, very serious indeed. At the absolute last moment possible, the handful of defenders of the Tempestus line was reinforced by the remainder of Legio Tempestus on Mars. All in all, this was but a fraction of the Legio's full might, with the rest of the Legion's engines scattered out through the various expeditionary forces, but it was still a considerably larger force than the one that had been holding the Tempestus line originally. That being said, they did not have an Imperator. Mortis did. And in an engine battle, size most definitively counts. And Mortis must have been feeling very, very confident, possibly justifiably so, because despite warning Vox hails from Tempestus, they continued towards the Tempestus line. It would appear that the reinforcements had arrived just in time, because moments thereafter, the Tempest line was breached by the engines of Mortis. Normally, such an egregious breach of trust, protocol, and general faith would be met with a hail of weapons fire, however, considering just how badly outgunned they were, and, in an attempt to salvage the situation, the Principe Signoris of Tempestus decided to not open fire. Instead, they chose to offer further warnings, partially due to the fact that, as I mentioned, they were horrifyingly outgunned, and partially due to the simple fact that sparking a hot engine war on Mars between two Titan legions was a thought too terrible to contemplate. And so the two legions simply stared at one another for a few moments before Legio Tempestus machines were struck by a veritable wall of scrap code. Then, braying in triumph, Legio Mortis began to turn, and set a course away from Tempestus territory. A shooting war, at least, had been narrowly averted, but at considerable cost, the Storm Lord, Legio Tempestus war leader, was dead. He had pushed his titan to the extreme to reach the Tempest line in time, and in doing so, he had pushed his engine to its absolute limits, and in turn, himself. An engine's principe is, in all due essentiality, its brains. And so, when an engine suffers, so too does the principe. And weakened as they both were, the scrap code assault pushed them over the edge. And with the death of the Principe, so too did the machine die. Without launching a single shot, Mortis had effectively decapitated Tempestus. The first victim in the Martian Civil War had been claimed, and first blood went to Horus's rebels. The next blow was struck shortly thereafter by the Fabricator General himself. He released the scrap code into the Margin Information Network. This vast network of cogitators connects every single forge on Mars. Normally, it is used to transfer information and various records between the various forges. However, on this particular night, it was used to infest practically every single system on Mars with the scrap code which then proceeded to do what it does best and fuck up absolutely everything. It ravaged the Martian surface, unleashing numerous catastrophes. A minute change in temperature in a forge complex's fuel tanks submerged thousands of square kilometers in fiery explosions. In another forge, the scrap code began pumping aerosolized cyanide into the habitation blocks, leading to the death of almost one million serfs. 
The forges, those unwilling to embrace the new order, were struck by one cataclysmic accident after another. Billions died as disaster followed cataclysm, leaving many forges as little more than hollowed out wrecks and crippling much of Mars's industry. The only forge to remain untouched by this cataclysm was the Magma City. Quite recently, Adept Seth had introduced a brand new concept in data sharing, the New Sphere. This, in all due essentiality, was Warhammer 40k's version of high-speed Wi-Fi. No longer did the various forges have to be connected via physical means. They could now communicate via the ether through thin air and send large data packages from point A to point B without the aforementioned physical connection. Previously, this had been virtually impossible. Small package information like, for example, essentially phone calls, radio transmissions and things like this could previously be sent from point B to point A over the airwaves. However, large-scale data transference had almost always had to be carried out via physical means, either via a direct connection or via the literal transportation of hard drives and data centers. This would turn out to be Adept Seth's greatest innovation, and it, at least in part, shielded her forge from the disastrous events that was sweeping the rest of Mars. However, we know of at least one other forge that had at least partially introduced the new spheric system, and it, although not suffering as badly as many other forges, still suffered an absolute beating during the events of what was to become known as the Night of Lost Innocence. So the new spheric system alone could not entirely account for why the Magma City had remained entirely unscathed. But of course, Adept Seth had been doing something else, sneakily, in her basement. At the same time that the scrap code was covering the entire surface of Mars like a wildfire, Adept Seth was conducting her experiments with the Akashic Reader. And after having tapped into the Astronomicon, every single circuitry within the Magma City was overflowing with the power of the Emperor's Beacon. In all due essentiality, every single surface, every single connection, every single circuit board, and every single person within the Magma City was, for a short period of time, suffused by the power of the Emperor. And as we have seen previously, the Emperor appears to be an anathema to chaos. This is the second major example we see that the Emperor's power is somehow the diametric opposite of chaos, the very existence of a fraction of the Emperor's power in the form of the Astronomicon is enough to completely and utterly shield the Magma Forces from the Scrap Code. And it is important to remember now that the scrap code is not just some simple computer virus, it is actually a thing of chaos. Let me bring you an example from the Liber Chaotica. So you know a virus, a biological virus. It is something we understand, it is something we know, it is a microscopic life form that, on occasion, can be utterly inimical to human life. It can quite literally kill us, but at the end of the day, it is a naturally occurring thing. It is something we can understand, and it is something that is entirely normal and natural in our material universe. However, Nurgle's plagues, although appearing to be the normal diseases, sicknesses, and virus of our world, are not, in fact, biological creations. They are, in fact, miniaturized demons, essentially. They are not microscopic bacteria or viruses, they are microscopic demonic life forms. Now, in many cases, they might be more normal biological things, like a bacteria, for example, that has been corrupted by chaos, in much the same way that a human can be corrupted by chaos, and therefore no longer be entirely human. This is the same way that the scrap code works. At its most basic level, it is, in essence, a computer code. However, it has been corrupted by chaos to the point where it can no longer be described as a computer code. It is, in fact, at this point, closer to a living being, and can, in fact, adapt itself to counteract any measures taken to cancel it out. 
For example, if you have an antivirus software, the scrap code will quite literally be able to notice what the virus software is doing to affect it and then adapt on the fly and virtually instantaneously to cancel out whatever means that the antivirus software has of defeating it. Which once again of course leads us to the conclusion that the Emperor's Light is in some way completely and utterly inimical to the Chaotic Powers. Now there is a lot of talk of what kind of a deal the Emperor might have made with the Chaos Gods, because we know that he made some form of arrangement with them. For example, we know that the Primarchs and indeed even the Space Marines are not entirely natural. There is an element of chaotic powers of unreality built into their very flesh. So I'm wondering if the Emperor's power is so utterly inimical to the forces of chaos if perhaps he managed to trick them somehow. Now we will be seeing a little bit more information about this a bit later, but I'm wondering if rather than the Emperor doing some kind of deal with the Chaos Powers, I'm wondering if the Emperor didn't perhaps trick the Chaotic Powers into a position of subservience to the Emperor. This is of course pure speculation, but it would also explain why they seem to be so afraid of him. For example, when they were attempting to turn and succeed in turning Horus Lupical, their emissary Erebus told him that the Chaos Powers were having their domain, their living space, eroded and destroyed by the Emperor. Now once again, the Chaos Powers rarely outright lie, so I expect there was at the very least some kernel of truth in that particular statement. And of course you might say that that might be through his annihilation of religion, and definitely I think that is part of it, but I also suspect that he himself as the Emperor, seeing as we have seen multiple instances of evidence of that right now, is directly, as in him personally, just by being alive, somehow a threat to the immortal beings that live in the warp. Which would be quite an achievement, after all, the Emperor is, in all due technicality, just a man. Or, well, just a man is a bit of an oversimplification, considering the fact that he has been alive for tens of thousands of years, but still, he is not, in all due likelihood at least, a god. And yet, the literal gods seem to be afraid of him. That is pretty interesting. But back to current events, Adept Seth had, through absolutely no fault or effort of her own, accidentally managed to shield her magma city against the ravages of the scrap code, placing her in an excellent position to resist further aggression from the Fabricator Locum. However, it also made it blindingly obvious to the Fabricator and his supporters that something was going on in the magma city. Every single other forge, whose loyalty was in question had been utterly ravaged by the scrap code, and yet the Magma City showed absolutely no sign whatsoever of even having been touched by the scrap code. Obviously something was very, very wrong. The Fabricator General decided to see if he could not perhaps confirm his suspicions by sending Horus' envoy to the Magma City to see if he couldn't figure out what was going on over there. Meanwhile, after having tried her absolute damnedest to annihilate the Magma City, Adept Seth had now murdered well, the vast majority of her psychers, blown up a considerable portion of her lab, and melted the Akashic Reader. Luckily for them, before the Akashic Reader actually had melted, the psyker who sat upon the uh, quote-unquote golden throne had told Dahlia, the creator of the Akashic Reader, that he had seen the future and it was a horrible, horrible place, and therefore Dahlia would have to wander off to Mordor with the One True Ring and fix everything. Okay, well that's not quite what happened, but that is essentially what happened. Dahlia now started seeing visions of a nasty thing lying beneath the Noctus Labyrinthus, and she decided to wander off in search of the nasty thing, because, well, that's what people do, isn't it? At the end of the day, however, it would turn out to be a very, very fortuitous event, because the ambassador that had been dispatched to the Magma City by the Fabricator General 
was not particularly subtle in his allegations. He told Seth that the fabricator general suspected that it was the Emperor who had launched the scrap code attack on all the loyal sons and daughters of the Red Planet, and therefore they must now unite and stand up to the tyranny of terror. And yes, he pretty much delivered it that goddamn bluntly. He was essentially standing there advocating for full and open revolution against the might of Terra. Adept Seth found his reasoning to be less than entirely convincing. And considering the fact that Adept Seth was not a complete and utter moron, she must undoubtedly have realized, at least to some degree, that it was not by coincidence that her forge had escaped essentially entirely undamaged. It probably had something to do with all of that golden light she had illicitly stolen from the Astronomicon. Good job on that again, by the way. On the other side, the War Master's emissary was not at all convinced by Seth's platitudes. Seth, of course, tried her damnedest to dance around the subject and not make her allegiance known, but, well, considering her outrage at the supposition that it was the Emperor who had launched the attack in the first place, that was not particularly convincing. She also took a fair bit of uh, umbrage to the fact that the War Master's emissary had brought along a tech assassin as his uh, bodyguard, quote unquote. Now, the tech assassins are an interesting little cult that are not in any way, apparently, connected to the Officio Assassinarum. This is essentially the Mechanicus's own version of the Officio, except it is um, more loosely controlled, shall we say. Whilst the Officio is an extremely delicate tool, only used against high-value targets that have been picked out with extreme precision and due care, at least it used to be back in those days, the tech assassins are more along the lines of brute force and forces. Nobody is likely to be stupid enough to step out of line knowing that this particular order of nasties are hanging above their heads, like the Sword of Damocles. And the Order of Tech Assassins has, as the name might suggest, specialized themselves in assassinating high-value Mechanicus targets, like, for example, Adepts, whose loyalties were in question. But just simply assassinating an adept might set a bit of an unfortunate precedence for the glorious rule of the new Fabricator General, or, well, old Fabricator General, just, you know, bigger, more expensive title, I suppose. So first they tried the legalistic route. You see, Adept Seth had already said some silly things in her talk with the War Master's Emissary. For example, she had stated rather emphatically that the Emperor was the Omnissiah, and there was no separate entity, and thusly, of course, the Omnissiah would never launch a scrap code attack on Mars. Now, if you interpret the laws of the Mechanicus with a bit of a, shall we say, wide lens, that might actually sound like tech heresy. Thusly, the Fabricator General had his justification for sending a large armed force of scrap code infected Skitarii and servitors to the gates of the Magma City, and led by that very same emissary just a few days later to attempt to arrest Adepseth for her many, many infractions and tech heresies, demanding that she turn herself over to the Fabricator General's justice. Luckily, however, while Adept Seth is clearly not the sharpest knife in the cupboard, considering the fact that she did not feel it necessary to tell her chief constructor that she would be passing a literally unmeasurable amount of energy through her headpiece, but hey, she was not quite stupid enough to simply surrender herself onto the mercies of the Fabricator General, who she suspected of being a little bit more involved in the whole scrap code attack than the emissary was letting on. Unfortunately for Seth, however, she had not yet had enough time to harden her systems against the scrap code, which meant when the army of the Fabricator General showed up outside her gate, all the emissary had to do was wave his data wand about, and every single hardpoint and defensive emplacement atop the walls of the Magma City immediately fell dormant. Bad. Bad, Mojo. Now, granted, the walls of the Magma City would still be defended by its Skitarii and various other auxiliary forces. However, without the heavy defense of the walls themselves, that would leave them more or less at the complete and utter mercy of the heavy weapons of the Emissary's forces. 
But Adep Seth had also figured that she would not be able to harden her systems against her attackers. She also knew that she would be attacked because the tech assassin had gone a little bit beyond her, um, shall we say, remits. She had been left behind when the Warmaster's emissary departed to infiltrate the Magma Forge, gain whatever data she could, possibly sabotage the defenses, and eventually potentially assassinate Adept Seth. However, in so doing, she had attacked a menial, and not just any menial, but one of the people responsible for the construction of the Akashic Reader, one of the people, in other words, on Dahlia's team. She had attacked her, stolen whatever information she could from her brain, and then scrubbed her memory altogether. She had also done this to another Adept. This made it quite obvious to Adept Seth that something was very, very wrong. One instance of somebody disappearing and then reappearing later on, either dead or if their memory entirely scrubbed, might be a coincidence in a city as large as the Magma City. However, two moments after a tech assassin shows up, yeah, unfucking likely. The only reason to do something like that was, of course, if you had hostile intents. And so, fearing that her wall defenses might be shut down by the same mysterious nonsense that had crippled practically the entire fucking planet at this point, Anapseth had called upon her allies and tributaries, granting her the aid of the Knights of Taranis and their Imperial Knights. The Emissary had brought more than enough forces to overrun a virtually undefended forge, but Imperial Knights were an entirely different matter. He did not have anywhere near enough troops to make sure that he could win against that kind of firepower. Not to mention, while he only saw a few knights, he had an absolutely no idea if there could be more hiding inside the Magma City. For all he know, the entire Order could be sitting right behind those gates, ready to open up with all manners of heavy walker-class weaponry upon his hordes of, essentially, infantry. And so he was forced to slink back home to the Fabricated General with his tail between his legs. And it was a damn good thing that the Emissary considered his own hide to be so valuable as to not risk it in a head-on engagement, because there were not a whole lot of knights available in the Magma City. The rest of the Order would eventually arrive, and they would indeed arrive before the main force of the Fabricator General could be brought to bear on the Magma City, but had the Emissary pushed the issue then and there, there is a decent chance that he might have been able to overrun the knights as long as they were not supported by the wall guns. But for the moment, at least Adept Seth's bluff had been successful. Time had been bought both for the Magma City and various allied forges to reinforce their positions. And of course, the Fabricator General had now rather irrevertibly played his hand. It was very, very clear to anyone with eyes to see that there would be no talking their way out of this one. Which meant it was about time to go find some very, very large guns. And this is where that whole network of alliances that we talked about earlier comes back into play. The Magma City was tied to Tempestus, which meant that they could call upon their Titans. There was but one small problem, of course, namely that Tempestus had not exactly escaped entirely unharmed either. They had not been hit anywhere near as bad as many had been hit, but their brief confrontation with Mortis had cost the life of their Principe Primaris. Now, one small caveat, however. The Principe had most certainly died, but he had been resurrected, brought back to life, and although his body, and indeed partially his mind, was shattered to the point where he could not live as a fully functional, normal human being anymore, that does not stop the Imperium from making use of valuable individuals. As such, he was interned inside an amniotic fluid tank, where he was slowly but surely retrained to command his titan via direct neural interference links via the amniotic tank, rather than the more ephemeral connection that he had while he was a full human. And by the way, full internment actually allows for much better control over the titan, as the Principe is linked far more closely to his machine. 
although the benefits are relatively small. We're talking about something like a zero point something increase in reaction speed. That can be quite a lot when you're considering that they are of course using Titan class weaponry. 0.5% might actually be quite a bit when you're utilizing a weapon that fire rounds the size of cars. As rather obviously, you rarely get a second chance when you're throwing around ordnance of that magnitude. However, the drawback is of course that the Principe now has to get used to what is essentially an entirely new and very, very different way of commanding his Titan. This meant that Tempestus was essentially holed up in their mountain base for weeks while their Principe Primaris recuperated. Temporarily, of course, command of the Legion was moved to his second in command, but he was not ready to make any real commitments to one or the other cause without first consulting the rest of the Legion, and preferably the Principe Primaris. Lucky then that the old boss man was a remarkably tough old man, and managed to retrain himself relatively quickly and assume command once again of the full Legion. Whereupon he immediately ordered that the full might of the Legion on Mars, which was nowhere near its full strength, but hey, it's all you got, would march for the Magma City and the aid of Adept Seth. And they would also be bringing along with them a special guest. As you may remember, the old man's own Titan had essentially died with him, and while the Titan could potentially be repaired, it would take years in the best case, and the Titan Legion did not have years. As such, the Primaris of Tempestus would march into war in the Legion's first war machine the mighty Deus Tempestus, which had been used essentially as a figurehead of the Legion for centuries and had not walked into combat for a very, very long time. But of course, all god machines are just that, god machines. And even though Deus Tempestus had not walked for decades, it had been kept in peak operational condition by the serfs and adepts of Tempestus. And just in God Emperor fucking time too, because the Fabricator General had finally figured that it was enough politics. The remaining portions of Mars' population, the various forges, military installations, etc., that had not bowed to him now, and had not been wiped out by the scrap code, were not going to yield to him. Before his rather embarrassing performance outside of the Magma City, the Fabricator General had a vague hope that Horus's ambassador might be used as a quote-unquote neutral third party that could bring the Fabricator General's information that the Emperor had supposedly attacked Mars to the various other forges and try to talk them into joining him peacefully, but, well, they had showed up outside of Adab Seth's forge, thrown around some rather blatantly false accusations, and then gotten chased off with their tails between their legs. This is not a good way to start when you're trying to strong-arm someone, showing weakness pretty much right off the goddamn bat. As such, the Fabricator General had to resort to somewhat more direct methods. It is necessary though to point out that that was not necessarily a catastrophically bad thing for the Fabricator General. He still had by far the largest army on Mars, and that was before the events of the Loss of Innocence. After the Scrap Code attack on all of his potential rivals, he had an overwhelming military advantage on any single one of his rivals. And at this point in time, said rivals were desperately trying to figure out what in the God Emperor's name just fucking hit us. I mean, again, this was a completely unprecedented event. Suddenly, practically everything goes to shit at the snap of a finger. There was a fair bit of, um, general panic, shall we say. And so, when the Fabricator General's hordes descended upon them, hordes that they did not know he possessed, and using technology that they had never seen before, well, it might be excusable that a fair few of them faltered rather rapidly. There were, of course, a few who managed to resist. 
primarily the Magma City and its directly connected forges. These knew that something was wrong, and considering the rather blatant attempt on Adept Seth's freedom, they also knew that the Fabricator General in all your likelihood could not be trusted. And while, as mentioned, the initial resistance was somewhat lacklustre, you gotta remember that the Fabricator General initially had expected there to be virtually no resistance. He had expected to cripple practically all of Mars in one fell swoop with the scrap code, and then simply move in and bludgeon anyone that is left standing. He expected to win Mars in a lightning assault. What he was faced with, however, was a long drawn out war. A war he was almost certain to win, granted, but one that he could not win quickly. And so open warfare blasted into existence all across the surface of Mars. The Imperium itself was stunned. They had not seen this coming. Battlefleet Solar immediately lifted anchor for all of their vessels and squadrons above Mars and reorganized themselves in a standoff distance from the Red Planet, confused as all hell as to what was going on. Granted, the Margins frequently attacked each other in a limited capacity, but they had never seen anything like this, and that of course also meant that they hadn't the faintest fucking clue who was attacking whom. And far more importantly, they did not know who to help, or indeed, if they should be helping anyone. Their only real potential action at this point was to send a space telegram back to Lord Dawn on Terra and say, Everything just went to shit, boss. We have no idea what to do. Save us. Luckily, the cedar tree growing in Rogel Dawn's rectal cavity knew precisely what to do. Rogel Dawn has never been the most subtle or roundabout character in 40k, and his solution to this particular conundrum was about as straightforward as one you would expect from Rogel Dawn, and he simply threw four companies of Imperial Fists at the Red Planet. He also backed them up with 13 companies of Saturnine Hoplites Heavy Infantry and four regiments of Jovian Grenadiers. A pretty damn considerable force by any standards, but very much so a scratch force. Seeing as Rogel Dawn did not know exactly what was happening on Mars, he did not know what he could throw at Mars safely, and he did not know if he could retake Mars quickly. To be entirely honest, Rogel Dawn was about as in the dark as everybody else, but unlike everybody else, Rogel Dawn simply just said fuck it and better to do something rather than nothing. A wise choice, considering of course that Mars was pretty much the only place within reach that was producing ammunition for his legionnaires and, more importantly, power armor. Hundreds of thousands of fully complete and operational suits of Mark IV power armor and many, many more weapons were kept in huge storage bunkers on Mars. These resources would be rather handy if Rogel Dawn had any real hopes of defending Terra against the oncoming onslaught of the Traitor Legions. As such, it would be kinda nice to nab some of those before the Red Planet dissolves into full-on chaos. As for the exact size of the Intervention Force, it is a little bit hard to determine. Now, during Horus Heresy, the size of a company of Space Marines varied a lot between the various legions. Some enforced strict regulations, some enforced practically no regulations whatsoever. For example, in the Sons of Horus, we know of company-sized formations as small as 36 Marines, and as high as a thousand Marines. And while you might rather reasonably think, to begin with, that the Imperial Fists, considering the sheer volume of trees that are currently residing in their various assholes, would be rather strict on their company sizes or organizations and regimentations, this was actually not the case. In fact, the Fists were pretty goddamn lenient, and even had several different organizations, like households, crusades, companies, regiments, battalions, etc. So in fact, they could vary their company sizes again from as few as a couple of squads to as many as a thousand marines. So the intervention forces sent to Mars could be anywhere from, say, 400 marines to 4,000 marines. 
Considering these were veteran companies and would therefore probably be organized in relatively large formations to maximize their effect on the battlefield, I'd probably surmise that we're looking at somewhere between two and a half to maybe three and a half thousand. As for the mortal contingents, the Saturnine Hoplites are elite heavy assault infantry. As such, they would probably be organized into regiments of somewhere between 10 to 20,000, giving us a total of 130 to 260,000. Considering their elite nature, I'd probably estimate somewhere closer to 130 than 260. Especially as you also need to take into consideration that Rogaldorn would have to organize these forces quickly, throw them onto any and all ships that could carry them, and get them over to Mars immediately. Which means that the larger the formation, the worse the hassle of feeding them, organizing them, gathering all of them, and shipping them over. So the smaller formation size is probably more likely. And then of course we have the four regiments of Jovian Grenadiers, who are mechanized and to some extent armored. Considering their status as a mechanized infantry formation, this would probably account for somewhere between another 20 to 60,000 men. That is, of course, also including the crews for the various armored vehicles. Best case scenario, that means that the Invention Force numbered some 300,000 men and 4,000 Astartes against the entirety of Mars. I'm thinking Rogel Dorn was being a little bit optimistic at this point, but again, in all due likelihood, this was meant to be a scouting force to try and get some more information for Dorn to maybe come up with a better solution. This is also quite clearly reflected in their mission objectives. The force was to aid any forges that seemed to be still holding out against the Fabricator General. Or, well, they didn't know it was the Fabricator General at the time, but it quickly became apparent who was loyal and who wasn't. One was employing armies of screaming monstrosities, and the other wasn't. So, that one's kind of a no-brainer. However, reinforcing and relieving these forges was a secondary objective. The primary objective was to secure as much in the ways of arms and armor as possible. So this, of course, fell to the Astartes. They divided into two equally sized formations with some reinforcements from the army personnel and attacked two primary forges, one of which was operated by the fabricator Locum and turned out to be friendly. The second forge was far, far from friendly and the Loyalists found themselves dropping right on top of fortified enemy positions. And to make matters just a tiny bit worse, these were fortified enemy positions in the middle of fortified enemy territory, which meant that the bad guys were about to receive a lot of reinforcements. Simultaneous to these two strikes, the majority of the Imperial Army elements landed outside various allied forges that were engaged with the Fabricator General's forces. These Imperial Army elements were to try to relieve these forges. Initially, the sheer shock and awe of the assault gained a lot of ground. Of course, on the first site, which was friendly, the Imperial Fists simply just landed and started loading whatever they could get their hands on. On the second site, they had to fight their way into the forge. Now, of course, these are Imperial Fists, they are assault specialists, and they made considerable gains early on, fighting their way into the primary facilities of the forges and securing considerable amounts of weapons and ammunition. However, it rapidly became blindingly obvious that pacifying the facility, much less holding it, was not even remotely possible, as millions of screaming lunatics, augmented by all manners of horrible mutations, came screaming in at the forge from all directions. The Imperial Fists would have to grab whatever they could, wreck whatever they couldn't, and get the fuck out of there. This was also the situation that practically all of the Imperial Army regiments found themselves in. They initially made very, very good ground against the besieging enemy because they were not prepared to get attacked from behind quite so suddenly. But it did not take long before reinforcements started flowing in from pretty much every single goddamn direction, and making any kinds of further gain was deemed impossible. And in fact, a lot of the Imperial Army units began retreating so as to not be surrounded and wiped out. 
And so, after several hours of intense combat, the decision was made for the Imperial Fist and their Imperial Army elements to withdraw from Mars. They had not brought anywhere even remotely close to enough Dukkha to launch any kind of truly effective and concerted offensive against the rebels on Mars. It was, however, now rather clear that they were indeed rebels. This was not some kind of a localized conflict, this was most definitively a ploy by the War Master. The rather brief but relatively successful Imperial incursion succeeded in securing many key individuals that still remained loyal, including amongst them the Fabricator Locum, who was now, as far as the Imperium was concerned, the de facto Fabricator General. They also managed to secure some 12,000 fully operational sets of Mark IV power armor and some 24,000 weapons. A pretty damn good haul, but in return, the Imperial Fist companies had practically all been reduced to half strength, and the Imperial Army regiments had in all due likelihood fared no better. But by far the bitterest pill to swallow must have been the fact that as far as the Imperium was concerned, Mars was now effectively out of the war. They could no longer rely on Mars's industrial capacity, her shipyards, her weapon storage facilities, or anything else. Granted, neither could the Rebels, as of course the Red Planet was immediately placed under a full blockade by Battlefleet Solar, but it was nevertheless a truly hefty blow to the Imperium to lose all of the manufacturing capabilities of Mars in a few weeks. Essentially, the War Master had managed to cripple Terra's access to ammunitions, armor, and vital supplies without firing a single goddamn bolt around of his own. You can say whatever you want about the War Master, but as far as this whole strategy thing goes, he was pretty damn good at it. Somebody that was not quite as pleased to see the Imperials leave, however, was of course poor little adept Seth, who just had to watch her rescuers stream back into orbit. Oh me, oh my. And the Magma City had been doing so well up until this point. It was of course a rather excellent defensive position surrounded as it was by, well, magma. Duh. And it could only be reached via two large causeways. One was attacked by Mortis and their Skitarii cohorts, and the other by the Fabricator General's ravaging hordes of mutated monstrosities. Or well, tech monstrosities. Rather than mutated, perhaps they should be modified monstrosities. I guess that would be technically more correct. Anyways, lots and lots and lots of spiky things running screaming towards the defenses, pushing them rather badly. Luckily for the Magma City, Tempestus had arrived in time, and, even more luckily, Mortis had not bothered to actually scout. Mortis figured that overrunning the Magma City would be easy peasy. The Magma City possessed very little in the way of anti-Titan weaponry, and as such they figured they could simply just walk all over the place, no real issues at all. This turned out to be less than entirely correct, as they were sucked in deeper into the defenses before Tempestus revealed their presence knocking out four Warhounds and a Reaver for zero losses on Tempestus' side. That is a rather fucking hefty victory. Four Warhounds and a Reaver for zero casualties. That would almost certainly have ended any conventional or even remotely equal engine fight. But Mortis had a lot where they were coming from, and to make things far, Far worse, Aquila Ignis had yet to make any move of its own, and while Deus Tempestus, the first god machine of Tempestus, was walking once again, it was just, quote unquote, a warlord. And whether or not it would stand any chance whatsoever against Aquila Ignis, well, it was looking a bit doubtful. But all in all, the Magma City was doing very well, it had held out for days, and by the time that the Imperial Fist's relief force arrived and tried to break their way into them, they were still holding out. However, the Fists and their Imperial Army contingents eventually had to retreat, leaving the Magma City to its fate. 
Its outer defences were slowly but surely being eroded by the seemingly numberless hordes of the Fabricator General, and Tempestus was also equally being slowly but surely eroded, losing one Titan at a time. They were inflicting far higher casualties upon Mortis, but Mortis could afford those casualties, Tempestus most definitively could not. And speaking of unsustainable losses, the Knights of Taranis had also showed up in support of the Magma City, and had led several sallies out against the Fabricated General's hordes, smashing apart charge after charge after charge, but steadily losing more and more knights in the process. And now of course with the Imperial reinforcements running back to orbit, it was pretty goddamn obvious how this particular coin toss was going to land. But Adept Seth was not entirely out of ideas just yet, it was just that her last idea, well it was about as good as that time she didn't tell her chief engineer how much power to expect. And so, the Knights of Taranis ran screaming out of the city. Oh, well, they did actually have an objective, but it sounds funnier, just imagine them running away immediately. So, they had managed to spot a palanquin, upon which sat Horus's Emissary, whom they disliked quite a fucking lot for dragging them into this and starting this whole war nonsense. As such, the remaining Knights of Taranis sallied out from the Magma City, heading straight towards this palanquin, surrounded as it was by quite literally tens of thousands of screaming maniacal tech monstrosities. One by one, the brave knights were overwhelmed and dragged down to the ground by the screaming hordes of malformed servitors and skitari, who perceived to rip open their canopies and visit a whole wide range of horrible fates upon the soft squishy person inside. In return, the knights cut them down by the thousands, chain glaives roaring, cannons barking, plasma screeching, inflicting unimaginable murder upon the enemy. But it seemed as if every last one of them would be torn to the ground before they could get within striking distance of the palanquin. However, through the brave sacrifice, though inevitable, of one of their own, one final singular knight managed to make it within striking distance of the palanquin, and managed to open fire upon Horus's emissary, who was shielded by his very own personal void generator. But... This thing was designed to deflect single attacks, sniper bullets, or individual attackers. It was not by any means designed to withstand the firepower of an Imperial Knight. The Void Shield bubble held for the merest quarter of a second before imploding, and exposing its wearer to the full firepower of the Knight disintegrating the palanquin, its bearers, and the emissary, along with a solid chunk of the nearby scenery. The Knights of Taranis ceased to exist as a military power on the battlefield of the Magma City, but they had got their revenge. And on the other side of the city, Tempestus was doing much the same thing. Legio Mortis had launched yet another assault, and this time it was led by Aquila Ignis. Tempestus managed to down another couple of engines of Legio Mortis before Aquila Ignis opened fire, and in the space of mere minutes, virtually wiped out the entirety of Tempestus. Tempestus had barely managed to overload a small portion of Aquila Ignis's defences, and had inflicted some damage upon its escort, but had in return been essentially wiped off the face of the battlefield in mere minutes. A depressingly predictable outcome, but for this outcome to be possible, Aquila Ignis and the rest of Mortis had to advance into the Magma City itself, and that is going to be a very, very important detail. 
Meanwhile, in the main control center of the Magma City, Adept Seth was preparing the city's self-destruct mechanism when she was ambushed by the tech assassin mentioned a bit earlier. She had been rummaging around the Magma City, murdering and violating lots and lots of adepts, something that had not escaped Adept Seth's notice. As such, she had prepared for this eventuality, much to the assassin's disgrace. You'd think that a professional assassin like this, once given the opportunity, would simply just headshot the poor bitch and get it over with. Instead, she decided she'd like to see her suffer and gutshot her instead, which gave Seth's own algorithms enough time to infiltrate the assassin's neural network and shut off all of her operating systems, leaving her as little more than a shell within which a soul resided. This meant that the assassin was entirely helpless when one of her former victims, having now been transformed into a cyber lifter servitor, grabbed her in a pair of massively augmented arms and jumped down a refuse hatch, leading all the way down to the magma below. And while Adap Seth was mortally wounded, she had enough life left in her to disable the safety measures that was keeping the magma city living on the magma. All of the void shields protecting the various support structures keeping the magma city away from all of that lovely magma was turned off. The void shields flickered out of existence, allowing the magma to begin eroding the support pillars. Within minutes, the magma city began plunging down into the magma below, and I'm getting kinda tired of saying magma. The result was that every single one of the traitorous little bastards who had invaded the city were now introduced to a rather hot new reality. Even the mighty Aquila Ignis only managed half a dozen steps before the mighty and massive legs of the gargantuan war machine began to melt and buckle beneath the weight of the god machine, plunging Aquila Ignis face first into the magma flows. The city had finally fallen, but it had taken practically the entirety of its attacker's strengths with it. If there is any truth to the old axiom that there is glory in death, then for the Magma City, that was most certainly true. But now that all of the dramatic shit is out of the way, let's talk about Dahlia and her trip to Mordor, shall we? Because there's a few tidbits I haven't touched upon just yet. Let's start with actually one that has nothing to do with Dahlia, so I lied. We'll, we'll talk about her soon, trust me. So... Dorne talks briefly to Malkador about their lost brethren, and he seems to have some regret around what happened to them, which is kind of interesting because there's a lot of little hints and tidbits about the lost Primarchs in the various Horus Heresy books. This seems to suggest that they were not purged, or at the very least they were not purged like, you know, traitors, for example. Perhaps they fell foul of the same kind of genetic conditioning that almost wiped out the Thousand Suns? It is possible, it is very possible. Even in modern 40k, the Primarch gene seed is not precisely stable, it is relatively stable, but, well, relatively is a wonderful term since it can mean practically anything. Anyways, returning to Mordor. So, Dahlia and her friend have wandered off to the Noctus Labyrinthus to meet Dahlia's dreams. It makes a hell of a lot more sense in the book, just trust me. I'm just going to paraphrase a little bit here because I'm not going to go through all of it because honestly, it's not really hugely lore important. What is kind of interesting though is that they run into the Caban machine. Now, I decided to not cover a lot of the smaller books, so I'm not going to cover the one in which the Caban Machine was created. However, I have read it. The Caban Machine was an artificial intelligence that was created as kind of a side project by an artisan, figuring, okay, what if I do this? Is what's going to happen? He did not agree with the mechanic's assessments that any and all artificial intelligence would automatically turn upon humanity. They even have like a little algorithm that says like within zero point something seconds an AI will decide must kill kill all humans, beep boop. Which is why in 40k, AI does not stand for artificial intelligence, it stands for abominable intelligence. 
And of course, him actually creating an AI broke all kinds of rules. Oh, Jesus. The last guy who did that got placed in a permanent stasis. Basically, because they figured, well, this will really suck. He'll essentially get to live out the rest of his life in super duper mega ultra slow-mo. They figured that was about the worst thing they could actually do to him, and... Uh, it might be. However, he did not create the Kaban machine and what was to become the Kaban machine out of any kind of malice. He just did it because it seemed cool. And to begin with, the Kaban machine was not hostile. It was, in fact, friendly and protective of its creators. Although, here's the thing. The Kaban machine did not hesitate in the slightest to kill to protect his creator. Oh, well... It's creator, I suppose. Let's be technically correct here. And that's the problem. The AI had no way of really putting any value on human life, so killing a couple of dudes to protect its master was, you know, done deal. Of course you do that. And that was the problem. And eventually, the Kabar machine ended up being corrupted by the fabricated general, and eventually ended up killing the very creator it had done so much to protect. It's a bit of a tragic story, but by the time that Dahlia runs into it, none of the original intelligence remains. It has been completely and utterly corrupted into a chaotic being that simply murders for the sake of it, and it tries its very damnedest to viciously and brutally murder Dahlia, but Dahlia fucks with its senses and actually gets away. It does, however, follow them, but we'll get to that in a moment. So, she arrives at the Noctus Labyrinthus, where she she meets the Guardian, an enigmatic old figure suffused with a golden aura. I suspect he might have been infused with a portion of the Emperor's power, and thus they could act like a jailer for the dragon. And this is where things get really interesting, and don't worry, I'm not going to make you wait for another episode, we're almost finished with this one after all. So, Dahlia is shown a vision where we see the Emperor somewhere in Libya around the 11th or 12th century. The dragon has been cast to Earth after a war with its kin in the heavens, and has landed near a city by the name of Silene, and the dragon has demanded that the population offer up a young woman to be sacrificed to it every day. When the city resisted, it slew all of the city's knights and soldiers, and so the city was forced to acquiesce. The dragon fed on their fear and became stronger, preparing to return to the heavens. This almost certainly means that it was a Catan. It feeds on fear, which is something the Catans do, it likes to pick on poor innocent little people, Catan hobby, and the whole War in the Heavens things most definitively sounds like something the Catans were doing. They were actively preying upon one another for quite the bit of time. At this point in time, though, the Emperor arrived. He is described as a famed warrior in the service of one Emperor Diocletian. This is a clear reference to the tale of Saint George and the Dragon. The Emperor defeated the Dragon, but he did not kill it. Why was that? Was he unable, or was it a ploy? He told the people of Silene that he was unable to kill the dragon, and that he was dragging it away to be interned for all eternity. Now, whether or not that is the truth... Hmm... Well... Because you see, he bound the dragon and placed it on Mars. Now this is rather interesting, because how the fuck did the Emperor in the 11th or 12th century get to Mars? Now, what I would personally speculate is that this was all created long, long, long after the fact. In fact, I do believe that the Emperor was the one who manipulated the dragon's memory to think that this was actually what happened. He wanted the dragon to view itself not as a Catan, but as a creature from the heavens with vague origins who had been defeated by the Emperor. Because I suspect that this was not done in the 11th or 12th century at all. I think this was done at some point either during or shortly after the fall of humanity's first interstellar empire, the Golden Age of Technology, which we refer to as the Dark Age of Technology because of all of the horrors that came after its fall. 
My supposition is that once the Emperor saw the galaxy falling apart around him, and humanity slowly but surely degrading back into an infinitesimally weaker state than what it once was, he thought, how can I avoid this happening again? And began laying the brickwork for his own galaxy-spanning empire. And he placed the dragon on Mars, knowing that it would eventually become the founding blocks of the belief of the Omnissiah, and by extension, the prophecies of the Emperor's coming. The Emperor knew what the Omnissiah was, and did not tell anyone, choosing instead to use this for his own purposes. I do not think this was at all a coincidence, nor do I think that the Emperor was at any point unaware of these events. I think this was a plan that had been in motion for a monstrously long time. Which further highlights the fact that the Emperor is not fucking human. He is clearly something very, very different. I mean, even just imagine coming up with a plan that is only going to come to fruition if a million of small things happen just like you want them to do 10,000 years into the future. Biggie is pretty goddamn special. But of course, this is all speculation. Perhaps this was in the 11th or 12th century. Or perhaps none of this happened. Perhaps the Emperor found the dragon on Mars and came up with all of this on the spot. Basically like, huh, I was wondering why they were calling me the Omnissiah. Hmm, well, I can use this to my own benefit, so fuck it, why not? Regardless, this all lends a fair bit of credence to the theory that the creature slumbering beneath the Martian surface is a Catan, and more specifically, Magladroth, the Void Dragon, an incredibly powerful Catan, which also tells us that the Emperor is ludicrously goddamn powerful, considering that a mere fragment of his being is somehow keeping the thing in check. Granted, a weakened Catan, but still pretty fucking impressive. And speaking of the fragment of the Emperor, Dahlia was now it. She was the new Guardian, and was going to have to sit there for another 10,000 years before the next sucker came along. Unfortunately for us, Dahlia was on the job for something like five minutes before having one of the most important artifacts within her care stolen from her. The very book that revealed to her the origin, or supposed origin, of the Void Dragon and the backstory of the Emperor was stolen. What else is inside of that book, I dread to think of. Though to be fair to Dahlia, she was a bit distracted with not getting her ass murdered by the Caban machine who had tracked her all the way there, which... Holy shit, if that thing had managed to make it all the way down to the Void Dragon, that would have been... Unfortunate. Luckily, a couple of knights had been following it and showed up just in time to murder its ass in return, avoiding what could possibly have been a remarkably nasty fate for, well, everyone, basically. So, happy ending, kind of? I mean, Mars is in open revolt now, millions are dead, wait, no, billions are dead. The Astartes are not going to be getting any supplies from that particular hellhole anytime soon. The Magma City is literally magma now, the Fabricator General is still alive and well, and a book that might hold all of the secrets of the fucking galaxy has been stolen by God only knows what. Mm, happy with modifications. It is of course not the last time we will be visiting Mars, however, and I'm looking forward to maybe seeing a little bit more info about the Void Dragon, because I just love the name, the Void Dragon. That just sounds fucking badass. But for now, this will have been my law breakdown of Book 9. Until next time, I have been Arch. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.